Hello, this is Ryan Womack, data librarian at Rutgers University Libraries in New Brunswick. Uh, this is a session on ggplot2. It is the second in the tidyverse approach series, learning to work with R. And as in other elements of this series, we're going to be relying on the sites that you see up here in the top right of the screen, as well as in the links below. I'm just going to run through those very quickly. Um, the data, data R site is a libguide for, uh, to collect all this information together, has links to our videos, um, has also additional links to other places on the web where you can learn R, and uh, links to older versions of these, these workshops as well. But the primary current series is hosted on GitHub. If you use the GitHub link that's posted on this site or go directly to the site, you will see the Tidyverse approach series of R files and other supporting materials. Today, everything we're going to use is in one R, R file, R graphics with ggplot2.r. That's the very last one on the list, at least uh, at the time of recording this. Uh, you can grab the entire bundle of code via Git or just downloading the zip file. Uh, you can grab that specific file if you just want to do this today's session. Um, either way, get a hold of our graphics with ggplot2.r. And also you might want to pull up in your browser uh, the reference to ggplot2. Uh, ggplot2.tidyverse.org is the site. The Tidyverse site has easy to find references to all of their uh, various packages. Um, so we'll refer to this just, just a little bit. Um, another thing that I can do is um, 50 example ggplot2 um, graphs. There's a site, actually this, the site is top 50 ggplot2 visualization. So before we actually jump into the code, I do want to just show you um, a quick answer to the question of why do we care about ggplot? Uh, because ggplot, we'll see a few uses of ggplot, but ggplot has many, many, many um, different visual methods that can be applied that are called geometries in the ggplot context. Um, these are all accessible via the same basic syntax and it's a very expansive package that still continues to grow. It does, uh, it has very good default behaviors for making your graphs legible and reliable scientifically. Um, and if you look at that top 50, um, that is uh, one, one place that shows that very clearly. I'm just going to paste that in our little window up here for a second. Um, you can just Google top 50 ggplot visualizations um, and you'll find it. All right, so now let me jump into our code to, to start working through our examples. I'm going to launch RStudio. Uh, my RStudio is again been customized with this black background, might not look exactly like yours. Um, I'm recording this with an open window in, in at home, so you might hear some background noise there, a helicopter overhead. Hopefully that won't be too distracting. All right, so I'm going into my Tidyverse Approach folder. I'm clicking on R Graphics with ggplot2, and you should see your sample code window here. Um, so I've listed all the packages you will need to run through this code. If you don't have any of those installed, you can go ahead and run the installs from line 7 to line 21. Uh, I would note uh, that the GIFSKI package, at least in Linux, um, requires you to go in and install separately in your Linux system Cargo. Uh, I haven't tried that in Mac um, or Windows to observe the behavior there. If you miss a, a couple of these um, package installs, that's also okay. Everything that we're going to do in this first part is 
just coming from ggplot2 uh, with the addition of a little bit of color brewer uh, work and again i apologize for the background noise um, now we're going to load all those packages at once so that we can um, just not have to worry about library commands as we're going through in the future so that's line oops 27 and beyond and i'm going to use control enter uh, my shortcut to to these um, as I go through and you should see those loading without I've got some slight warning messages there that certain things are being masked from other packages but that's okay um, and now I have loaded all, all of my libraries and I'm going to be sort of adjusting the screen here a bit as I go through to either highlight code or graphs um, when I chart something, it's going to show up in the bottom right quadrant of my uh, RStudio installation. So you'll see me dragging the windows around, which is you can do in RStudio. It's a nicely customizable interface. All right, so now just to get us uh, thinking about data visualization, I am going to run the whole chunk of code from line 41 down to 81 41 to 81 uh, this is a sort of a canned script that will generate um, a sequence of plots uh, in our plots tab Let's see if that's there uh, the plots tab is where these things are going to display when you're in our studio if you're not in our studio you also get a you get a separate pop-up window which sometimes can be nice for really maximizing the screen viewing ability of your graphs uh, but we're pretty much going to stick within our studio uh, for this session okay what is this this is a famous example in data visualization it's called Anscombe's quartet uh, the data for that is built into R so you, it's a built-in example uh, and the an this answers the question partially of why we want to do data visualization so this is a, is a slightly artificially constructed example. But here we have four small data sets, these data points that have been plotted on a scatter plot. If we drew a regression line through each of these data sets, it turns out that these have been constructed in such a way that the regression line through them is identical for all, um, all four of these uh, data sets. And that's a little puzzling right when you look at the data visually they're very different um, if we were just to use numerical methods we would see these similar correlation uh, similar sloping <coughs> relationships and we wouldn't understand what was really going on with the data so only this first quadrant the top left quadrant in red matches our mental model of what an ideal regression should be like the the line does characterize the points. The points roughly parallel the line with some random variation. Um, but this looks okay for a regression. If we move to the second case, the top right in blue, we see, okay, the line does go through the points, but clearly it's the, the data is not linear. The data is plotting a curve, and we could take a second step to improve the fit by accounting for that curved relationship rather than trying to run a linear regression. Uh, the third case in green at the bottom left is uh, if we look at the vast majority of the points, all but one point, uh, reflects a somewhat flatter slope, a, a flatter relationship between these two variables. And one point that's way up high is dragging that nice line out of shape in terms of the regression and then you if you see something like that you want to ask yourself okay is this an outlier uh, is it was it correctly measured what's really going on with that um, point and the fourth case bottom right in yellow is the most extreme here we have only one point one outlier that's driving the entire relationship if we took that point away we would have no variation in X which essentially means that X doesn't vary at all 
as, as y varies. There's no relationship except for this one point, but the regression makes it look like there is. Um, and we could get at that relationship by studying the residuals and studying, you know, sort of each, how each point behaves, but we see it instantly with a graph. And data visualization is designed to, to give us those insights, to let us view, get a better understanding of the data, more complex data can be understood through data visualization, and we want to give you the tools to do that. Again, in this session, primarily focused on ggplot, but I am going to um, introduce things by showing you a little bit of other packages, just so we're not completely insulated in the ggplot environment. So I want to talk about uh, a lot of these examples are going to be a uh, classic, widely used sample data set that's called the diamonds data set. It's in ggplot2. Um, this, these commands won't find the diamond data set unless you have run the library command up in line 28 for ggplot2. So if you get an error, that is probably the reason um, if it can't find the data. Just go back and make sure you've run all the preceding commands. So we're going to load the data in line 85. We are going to use our help feature. Remember, that's the question mark. Question mark diamonds will let us see the information that's been provided about this data set. And um, I apologize for those of you who this data set might already be familiar to you, but we're this is an intro session, so we're going to talk things through. And we have over 50,000 diamonds in this data set with their prices, their carat weight, and some other characteristics that affect the price of diamonds, like the cut of the diamond, a rating for that, a rating for the color of the diamond. Is it a nice, clear, white diamond color, or is it yellowy? Um, and clarity is a measure of how clear the diamond is. There's a few other things that we're not really going to refer to those other ones uh, so much. Now, in base R, uh, you often might start with a plot command on line 90. Oh, and excuse me, I skipped the line. That's why I have an error. I did not attach my diamonds data set. So remember to run the line 87. Um, we're, we want to attach the diamonds data set so that we can use the shorter variable notation by making diamonds our default data set. And you can, you can confirm that it's been attached by seeing it up in the top right environment list. All right, now my plot command on line 90 should work. I'm plotting price against carrot. Now, it, we saw uh, the, in the regression that we did in the previous session, we see this sort of tilde or squiggly line, whatever you want to call that, notation um, that I would typically interpret that as as a function of, right? So if you're doing a, a regression of one variable as a function of another, here we're doing price as a function of caret, uh, which seems to suggest that the price should be on the y-axis and caret should be on the x-axis. Typically, that's how we might look at that. So you say price tilde caret. If we reverse that by saying plot caret tilde price. And the tilde key, by the way, is at your top left of your keyboard um, with, it, with a shift typically to access it. Uh, we can reverse what's on which axis, um, but it's, you know, it's a fairly straightforward command, just gives us the, the scatter plot. The important thing to note about the base R graphics is that it is uh, simply a kind of paint on screen system. So we paint on the screen our uh, scatter plot. If we want to do something else to it, we can just simply run an additional command and it will layer it on top of this graph. Um, so if I say AB line, this is line 93, AB line is a command that draws a line from A to B, just a linear line. And 
that line can be defined in various ways. Here I'm defining it as a, as a regression. So it's drawing the regression line through the points. And I can adjust some things like the color of the line and so forth. Um, it's important to note that if I um, do something uh, that just starts with with an AB line command. I, I'm not sure how this is going to behave in our studio actually. Uh, so here I still have this graph up on the screen, but if I say like histogram of price, that'll give me something else on the screen. And if I try to plot a line on top of this, um, well, actually it, it gave me a funny interpretation of that. It, it did draw a line. Um, this is easier to see if you're not embedded in the RStudio environment. Um, ah, here we go. I, I want to clear the plot. So I'm clearing all the plots. If I had no plot there and I ran a B line, yeah, I'll get an error, right? Because it's there's nothing for it to draw the line on top of. It needs a plot, you know, to, to start and then you draw a line on top. What this also means is if you make a mistake along the way um, and something doesn't quite come out the way you'd like it, you have to go back to the first step, you know, replot the graph, layer the pieces again on top. And there's another disadvantage to this, which I'll get into in just a, a little bit later. Um, it'll be easier to see at that point. Um, but, you know, the, this is functional. There are a lot of very functional base our graphics commands. You might see code examples that use those. That's fine. Uh, but when we see ggplot in action, we'll see the advantages of ggplot over this type of syntax. Um, I'll also point out on line 95 that um, we can adjust all of the, um, we can tweak all the parameters in a graph uh, typically by specifying options one after another with commas uh, so here we say col equals steel blue. That affects the color of the points. PCH equals 3 is the style of the points. That's a printing character. And then we can simply specify each of the labels for the axes and the main title. Um, also limit the axes here with this xlim command. So that's an example of a more fully featured graph with lots of things specified. Um, and you can go in and actually label specific points. You can manually write something at a specific space on the graph. Uh, sometimes that, that sort of manual control is beneficial um, compared to the things that are automated. Placement of things tends to be automated in ggplot2. It's a bit harder to do it in a very specific way. Um, so keep this in mind as a contrasting example. All right, that's all I'm going to say about base R, though, in terms of graphing. Now I want to talk for just a couple of minutes about Lattice. Lattice is another very popular and pretty powerful package in the R space. It also has, we're not going to see them in this short session, but it has many different things it can graph. And if you like the base R syntax, you will like Lattice because the syntax is very similar. And it has one major addition, additional strength, maybe two major additional strengths. Um, let's start with the base example on line 99. This is if we just want to do a plot of a scatter plot. The command is now xy plot. You'll notice that's slightly different than the base r command. That's a good thing because the commands don't conflict in the r namespace. We can mix and match between lots of different graphics approaches. Uh, but otherwise, the syntax is the same. But what's its special magic power? On line 100, we see that in action. Lattice has been designed from the ground up around this concept of being able to compare groups very easily. So I have a cut variable. There are five different cut ratings. I'd like to see how the data differs by cut. All I need to do in Lattice to do that is to draw the type the vertical line or pipe or whatever you want to call that symbol that lives above the return key on your keyboard. And then 
the name of a categorical variable. It would have to be a categorical variable after that. So this is you know very simple, but we get these instant comparisons among the groups. This is um, a concept that's been referred to by Edward Tufte as the small multiple, uh, where you have graphs that are have identical scales, identical sizes, identical formats, but for each group we have them all sort of lined up. It makes it very easy for you to mentally compare and your eye to draw the, the differences between those different groups. And here we see a slightly steeper relationship. The price goes up faster the, the higher the cut rating of the diamond, which would make sense, right? That the ideal diamonds have the best uh, have a a steep slope up in price as they get larger. Okay, there's more we can do with lattice. That's on lines 101 to 103, so I'm just going to run through those. Um, we can color the points with a groups option. Groups equals cut. Uh, in this case, the cut rating is reflected by the color of each circle there. We can do more complex things by mixing and matching these things. So if, if I say let's divide the data by cut plus clarity, what it will then generate for me is every single combination of cut and clarity. And this um, image, um, if I export it, um, I can probably get a better view. This, this is actually a good chance for me to show you the RStudio export button. If, you, if we want to get these graphs out of the R and RStudio environment, we have two choices. One is the button here, and one is a command line version, which I'll show you later. So I'm going to export it. I'm going to save it as an image um, into my R directory. Um, I'm going to make it sort of large um, to take advantage of the size here. So I believe, is that a 4K? I forget the um, 3200 by 1980, something like that. Close enough. Um, we can update the preview. Um, and I'm just going to save it. Now, if I look at my files, and I go up to my R directory. Actually, I'm sorry, where did that save it? Um, that saved under my documents folder. Okay, so what I would like to do actually is, I'll, I'll just navigate to that in files. I don't know. So I, I'm not going to actually, I'm going to end up delaying the video too much if I um, hunt this file down. Um, what I would like to do is save a large version of this in my local direct it is there it's it's in my r directory um it's simply not is my file window not refreshed did i just miss it um documents So I have my, you know, here's, here's R, here's tidyverse approach, and I'm just not sure why that's not showing up in this view, unless RStudio is screening things for me. A little bit puzzling to me. Um, but I, I've digressed for, for too long on that. The, the, the point there is that we can export these files. I wanted to show you that when you 
expand the size of this that we get actually more real estate for the data points and it becomes more viewable. You can really blow this up on a larger monitor. I could have done that a simpler way by simply clicking the zoom button um, and popping out, which pops out this window. And then when I enlarge it, you'll see that it, as long it, it has a certain default space that it uses for the captions. And now I have a better view of the data. And so this is um, every, I believe 40 combinations, eight um, clarity ratings versus the five cut ratings. And on line 103, we can mix and match even more. We can use our colored points in combination with the grouping by cut. And we can also provide a legend to what those points mean. Uh, simply by saying having this key auto key function so you know those are details that you would learn if you if you got into this approach into the lattice approach um, it's important to, to recognize though that you know if, you, if you've got data that needs to be sliced into groups frequently this will save you a lot of time rather than doing other kinds of data manipulation uh, ggplot can do the same kinds of things but it's not quite this you know super quick natural syntax that Lattice has. Um, so you, I do want you to be aware of those those comparisons. Um, the second major difference with Lattice versus Base R is that we can store a graph as an object in the Lattice space. Now I'm just mentioning that now uh, because I'll, I'll demonstrate it when we d get into ggplot further, but put a, a marker on that, that concept. All right, now we are going to move to ggplot itself. Probably taking too long to get to this point. Um, but ggplot is different. And I wanted to show you those other examples to show you how the syntax is different, um, what it's doing. And I should also mention as an aside, I'll, I refer to sort of indiscriminately to ggplot versus ggplot2. The package was revised very early on in its life before it was even very popular from a package called ggplot to the package called ggplot2. So the package name is ggplot2, but the commands that it uses to draw the graphs are ggplot. Um, and here I'm going to stretch my window back to the right a little bit so we have a little more room to look at the commands. All right, the, our first example of a ggplot command is on line 110. And you'll notice that unlike other commands in R, it has two parts. It has a first part that starts with ggplot and a plus, and then it says geom point. Um, this is fundamentally related to the whole concept of why did they write ggplot? Why did Hadley Wickham initially start to develop um, this? Is It is an implementation of uh, an influential book by Leland, I believe Wilkinson, uh, called the Grammar of Graphics. And the idea is that a graph can be separated into logical components. And actually for computer processing of images, it's there are significant advantages if you're very clear about how the grammar works. We'll see a little bit of that here. So there's a first part which really specifies the data that we're working on and the variables we'd like to see. Um, that's the fundamental piece that you need. Here we're using the diamonds data set and we would like to display on the x-axis carrot and on the y-axis price. So you can kind of see those elements here and you may be wondering why does it say AES? Um, AES is an abbreviation for aesthetics and in the grammar of graphics the aesthetics are applied to the things that you want to display. Right, so we would like we, we have the entire diamonds data set, but we would like to get aesthetics on carrot and on price. So that's that's what that initially sort of cryptic abbreviation means. You'll get you'll see it all the time in ggplot, and you'll get used to it. Uh, after that, we need to s then talk about well, what do we want to do with the with this data? How do we want to display it? And that is the geometry. Um, and those commands 
start with the geom and then the type of geometry. So geom point draws points, and so that's basically our scatter plot. If we were to run this command without the second part, what we will get is just a blank grid. I missed a parenthesis there. Because it, it recognizes the data and it, it, it looks at the data and figures out the range of carrot and price, but we haven't asked it, we haven't told it how to display it, so we're kind of stuck at this point. Uh, so functionally, every ggplot command needs at least those two parts, one about the data and one about how to draw it. But we can add additional pieces. We can um, add additional pluses. And for example, the, the command, what did I do there? The command on line 112 um, adds a new thing, which is the facet. Um, so this is a way to slice the data like we did in Lattice. And it's facet wrap is the option. Um, wrap actually just means that we're wrapping it around so that it fits the available space rather than um, facet grid, which is the other option for that, the major option. I'm not sure if there's if it's the only one. Um, I never like to be absolute about things, but facet grid lines up the data on a grid. Um, we can also change the you know the directionality. There are options to fine tune the display here, but I'm I'm starting with the basic chunks. So facet wrap, one example, uh, line 114, we have an example of how do we modify our options. And we'll return to this in a more in-depth example near the, near the end of this part. Um, the, if we want to adjust the colors of points like we did with lattice with the groups cut statement, we have to adjust the points within, within the geom point part of the command. So here's there's another AES. We're asking for aesthetics again, how, it's dis how it looks, how it's displayed. And the aesthetics of the points themselves will be set by color equal to the cut um, value. I, I want to be clear again, the, the cut here is the val variable name, right? So any variable name can be used. Color is the syntax option. Cut is the variable name. And in this case, ggplot automatically provides a legend for you. And you know the style of ggplot, I find it very pleasing. It's, it's sort of clear but minimalist. Um, they have certain practices, like you'll see this gray background with the white lines. That is a way of subtly being able to display the grid so we can specifically reference exactly where a point lies without distracting too much from the points themselves. It kind of sits in the background. Um, and my watch is talking to me. So we have um, the final example of a basic ggplot scatter plot is in line 116. And this is what it looks like if we're trying to re replicate the earlier graphs we saw of all the labels. And you can see, again, it's implemented in ggplot with separate grammatical sections. So the limited, the axis is its own step, x lim. And all of the labels um, get their own section. So there's a labels section plus labs where we can say x axis, y axis, title. We can have subtitles, things like that. And the points themselves get modified inside, once again, the geom point command. We can specify options like color, printing character, inside there. So it's, it, it's a different style to get used to. And I'm going to try to point out the advantage of this style, again, in the later examples coming up in maybe five minutes, uh, to show you one other Example of a ggplot style. We have a bar chart. Um, this is just geom bar. 
and actually the uh, position this is called the stacked position when the bars are vertical like that but that's also the default uh, for geom bar so if we ran geom bar without any options we we would get the same thing um, if we want to here's clarity by the way so here's the distribution of clarity uh, of the diamonds number of diamonds in each clarity rating illustrated in the bar chart and if we want to do a more complex example we can do something like this so this is I've asked for clarity as my main um, variable of interest so clarity is on the x-axis but I've also asked for a facet by the cut variable so I have grouped the data by cut and within each group of cut I've got the number of diamonds by clarity rating it's interesting that there are actually um, many more ideal cut diamonds there are not so many of these poorly cut diamonds in the data set um, if I'm ever curious about more more on any of these ggplot um, geometries I can go to the site I can go to the reference section and you can see the contents on the on the right are information about all of those um, aspects of the data and layers is primarily controlled with this geoms right so geoms bar charts stat count box plot contour charts like with again the same basic um, syntax we can do all kinds of uh, things and we can even combine them much more easily since they're all in the same package we'll see examples of that in a moment as well geom map we're not, we're not going to obviously go through all of these but it, it's important to recognize that you know it's really quite powerful package um, you can dig around to find many of the most common things you need to do with your visualization you can find them in ggplot either here or in the extensions which is going to be the second part of this video all right now here's a big one on line 126 when we have something in ggplot we can actually save it as an r object so on line 126 to the right of the assignment operator i have a full graph command it's not going to appear on screen when I run this command. It is going to be loaded into the my graph object. And so when I run that, you'll see now I have my graph and I've got my internet is in and out. You can see like I've got this um, notifications uh, sort of crashing my screen here. Um, it's going a bit crazy right now so what I'm going to do is uh, just quit that 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 should um, clear up <laughs> the warnings on the screen here uh, so my graph is this ggplot graph I can um, type my graph at any moment and pull it up in the workspace to see it so this enables us to like if we're running code and we need to generate a hundred different graphs we can generate them all in code and then pull them up as needed in different contexts and it makes it you know easier to refer to things easier to reuse things and easier to modify things as well because we can actually update these graphs change the colors change a lot of the basic features without redrawing them um, even doing things like letting a user specify you know my favorite color is red so I'd like to have my points always display in red you could you could do that with ggplot2 okay so saving as an object is important this again is I mentioned about lattice uh, lattice can do this too so you're, you're not limited to ggplot if you want to just save your graphs Lattice can do it. Base R plot commands cannot save the graph as an object. 
so you know it's it comes once on the screen and then it's gone um, for certain kinds of kinds of applications that's a disadvantage all right so now also very important for coding purposes in line 130 to 138 what I've got here are if I export the the graph I can export it to a file either PDF or JPEG or PNG um, maybe a couple of other image formats as well there and the command the first example here is PDF I'd like to create a PDF called output.pdf I give that instruction in line 130 and then I can write run various um, ggplot commands and they don't appear on the screen they go into the file when I'm done I say dev off and you know that's a kind of a low-level statement that just turns the device off there's like a PDF writing device um, and you turn it off so that now future commands would be directed to the screen rather than the file uh, the same thing for JPEG of course with an image you can only do one at a time so you can generate the image you can specify the size the quality um, a few other options and say dev off um, if you go and look at those commands in the help you'll see you know the options that that can be specified. TIFFs you can also create. Um, and these would then, you know, sit in your files. And yeah. So here I've I'm I'm just accessing my files directly from my operating system. Um, probably should have pulled that up in a different viewer but um, here's the image the JPEG that I created um, here's the PDF which has one image per page and here is the plot that I tried to um, show you before like if I have a very um, high resolution I get more space for my data itself and so you could export really I was doing kind of the screen size uh, but you could export to very high resolutions if you felt like it and and resolve the data at a, at a high level so this is very advantageous you know you can um, really um, get very uh, specific with these commands and again if you've got a hundred graphs to to draw or more you have your code can loop through a process of just running them pasting the uh, sending the output to a file and then your directory will have all your results uh, without you having to step through the process in any other way you can completely automate that so very important feature um, so here I, I'm just going to show you uh, couple other quick things uh, a histogram is a geom histogram in its plain form it looks something like this but we have other options in ggplot uh, to make our graphs more colorful more interesting uh, this is just one example on line 142 where I have said AES fill by the the, the count right so the I've asked the bars to be filled in on the basis of the number of diamonds that are in each bar which kind of gives this shading to the to it as illustrated by the legend that the, when we have more diamonds we have a lighter shade of bar gives a little bit of this is not terribly informative but it gives a little visual interest to the um, to the graph and we can keep tweaking in a number of different ways so like 145 um, we can get away from the sort of basic gray presentation that is the default um, a good default for printing out things on you know black and white printers um, but 
we may want other things for other contexts. And so here you can see each option gets associated with its relevant grammatical part. So I've got geom bar and the fill of the bars is purple. But the other uh, things are in this new theme option. I haven't used that so far, but there is a theme option that specifies things like the panel background and the colors of the lines, um, the colors of the fill throughout um, any of the graphs. Um, the second one is 146. This is the same idea, but just using the options to get a more black and white view. Uh, 147 is using the additional package called R Color Brewer, which plays very well with ggplot. Um, there's this scale fill brewer uh, option that invokes the color, color brewer manages these sort of ranges of colors for you. And so we can generate a palette of reds that's going to automatically be nicely scaled to the number of options we have, right? If we had five options, um, for example, um, I'll just reverse this graph by plotting based on cut instead of clarity. And instead of slicing it by cut, I'll slice it by clarity. So this should give me an eight paneled view with five options on each, each one. And it, the legend is a little squished together, but you kind of get the idea. You see how the colors automatically updated. And there are several, you know, nice built-in uh, spectrum. The ones that are not all one color, but diverging colors. And if you look at the documentation for our color brewer, you can access those. Um, and it, it gives you a very quick way to make your graph look more sophisticated. You can also manually specify your colors if you, if you really would like to do that. And that's scale color manual. And you would input you know, a specific list of colors that matches the, the number of categories in your data. You have to be a little more fussy about that. All right, so now I, I have a section I call this using the power. All right, so, so we've learned about this grammar. We've seen examples. And maybe you're still not convinced that this is a, a, a great thing. Um, perhaps this example will, will push you over the edge and, and, and make you see the advantage of this in a programming context. Is that you know we can also save these code chunks as elements in R. This is an example of where R is, you know, it's interesting how the language is flexible like that. In 153, what I've done is I've taken the components of the command that work with the data, and I save it as something called my data. Similarly, for my theme, I save the theme options. And similarly, for my chart, I save um, the options for a specific chart. And those disappear in my R workspace. I haven't invoke them yet, but I now can construct a full graph just by linking these th these three things together. Together they make a full uh, set of options for a graph. And here's, you know, here's my, my graph. Now I could include something like this, my data, my theme, my chart, in any, in like a generic program to, to graph my data. And then when I need to make a change, I can just make a change once at the beginning of the file or in an input dialog to say, you know, I'd like to change um, my theme. All right, if I change my theme to be um, not light blue, but um, light green. By the way, if you if you Google or you just type a list, you type the um, you get into the help for colors. Uh, for R, you'll see there are 650 some combination named colors to use. 
and as long as you're using one of those you know you, this command is going to work it's not completely arbitrary what I'm doing here so I changed the the color of the fill to green and now I could um, you know update my chart like that but imagine that I have um, you know again a hundred graphs and I want to apply the same theme to all of them uh, this is a very easy way to do that um, and the the more reusable you make your your code you know the the more time you're going to save in the long run um, also by the way I don't have to apply the theme at all like if I, the theme is actually just optional specifications so if I'd say my data plus my chart it kind of just reverts back to the default gray background you know so you have a, a lot of options there um, you know, you could even have, again, the themes customized to particular users just for what they like to see. All right, now we're going to look at um, a few more examples um, quickly of different types of plots, just to give you a sense of, you know, what ggplot is capable of. If we want to do a regression and illustrate it on a graph, we have an additional option is to layer multiple geometries on top of each other. So line 160 draws points with geom point and draws a line. Now the, the name of the command for the line is geom smooth. It's drawing a smooth line and with the method of linear regression, method LM, which as we know is, is the um, linear regression command in R. Uh, so here's a linear regression through our data. Uh, it does predict that there will be a very high price for these five carat diamonds. So therefore the graph looks a little deformed like that. That's why sometimes I've been cutting off the X limit at three carats so that it, it eliminates that outlier driven uh, segment out on the right. Uh, second example on 161 is stat smooth and this is interesting um, I haven't seen this one fail before and it didn't fail on a a different um, computer just a week ago so I'm a little puzzled uh, normally this would draw a, a curved res regression line through the data that tr tries to provide a better fit. Um, the second, the li on line 162, this um, also illustrates it. Um, I'm not going to try to debug 161 on this machine because I feel like that's somehow machine specific. Um, I'll, I may look into that a little bit later. Uh, on 162, this is a simpler example with a smaller data set showing you essentially the same thing that we have um, our points, our blue regression line through the points, and by default, the smoothed uh, estimate draws a confidence interval around the points. So, you know, this is our best fit to the, the points, but with this uh, confidence in the predictive value of that um, relationship. Uh, that confidence interval can be customized, but that takes a little more work. It's not just sort of like an easy setting. Um, the The larger point here, though, is that as long as you're you're talking about things that can be drawn on the same type of graph, right, you wouldn't want to mix and match polar coordinates and cart Cartesian coordinates. Um, but a lot of things can be easily layered. Uh, in ggplot and then again saved all as one object with with all the layers on it unlike base R. All right. Violin plot uh, this is just a little bit of different way of visualizing the density distribution of data um, it, it shows up some different relationships we've been looking at this diamonds data for a while but um, these density plots make it very clear that, you know, we had a lot of ideal diamonds, uh, but they tend to be actually very small, uh, which is why their price is low. So the ideal diamonds 
um, and may be easier to cut in an ideal way when they're very small. Um, you can see that the bulge that represents the low price diamonds is very high for ideal, but those fair diamonds have quite a number of higher price diamonds, surprisingly so given that that's the worst rating. That, ten, that is actually because they're quite large. Um, and so the violin plot gives us you know, a different way to explore these characteristics. Um, again, the width of the, of the bulge, it's, it's essentially a mirrored density distribution. And the mirroring lets us see the width and thickness of it um, a bit easier. So we can see that how the points are distributed. Um, another thing to notice, right, is that what we've done, we could have just done a single violin plot by not specifying the x variable, right? So we have x equals color, y equals price, meaning that we're asking for the x-axis to be grouped by something. If we take the x option out, um, Actually, no, it does require it does require something to display on the x-axis. So if we um, displayed something that was um, just not categorical, but a single uh, measurement like depth, in that case, uh, we, we don't get the broken down categories. We get um, this proportional uh, density, right, where we can see that um, the high-priced diamonds um, have a different sort of depth rating um, than those at, at uh, the sort of extreme ends, or sort of misshapen type of diamonds, right, it would be the a few of those at the extreme ends of the spectrum. All right, now we have the box plot on line 171. Um, very quick example. So box plot, you know, um, the box represents the middle 50% of the data from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile. Um, the bar is actually the, the mean, typically, of the data. This is something that I would like to look at the help for because um, one thing I've found is that, um, sorry, it's the median, not the mean. I, so I just wanted to be clear about that because um, what you do find in, in some of these implementations is like the definition of the outliers. Some of the smaller factors are implemented slightly differently in different uh, software tools. So the, the, the line here, correct myself and say the line is the median of the data. And the box represents the range from the 25th percentile to 75th. And the bars represent the sort of major area. Typically, that's that might be three standard deviations of data. And it's something that's a true outlier beyond that shows up as a point. Now this is a big data set with, with thousands of entries, so we have actually quite a lot of points that are still outliers, uh, these sort of thick thick tails to the box plot. Now you might wonder, how can I flip this box plot? This is a vertical box plot. How do I get a horizontal box plot? Here's a brand new, uh, G, uh, brand new piece of grammar that we haven't seen yet, and that is the chord flip option. So coordinate system is another aspect of the grammar, right? Because we can think about when we transform the coordinate system, we don't transform the data. We just transform the, um, not the look and feel of individual points, but the whole um, basis for its display. And so therefore that's grammatically separate and we do it with this plus coord flip, which takes the same data and changes the axes. So now we have a horizontal box plot.
Okay, so at this point, um, yeah, I'm going to uh, stop um, this uh, segment at line 198. So we have a little bit more to go. Uh, I am going to talk about GG ridges, which is uh, the GG ridges part of this is um, an optional extension to ggplot. So we're, we're getting into the more advanced material or the sort of extended material uh, at this point. All right, we we'll start with the basic example on 175. 175, a basic density, density plot just estimates the you know, probability density distribution for the data, which is a way of looking at how the data is distributed. We have a lot of, again, low carat diamonds here, and we have some peaks around one, one and a half, two di carat diamonds because those diamonds are cut to what people would like to buy. But that's, you know, a fairly bland looking line by itself. We might want to add some depth to it. So line 176, I've asked the density to be uh, broken down by clarity, and so each separate clarity rating gets a different color uh, of fill, right? And so that's essentially what's happening in 176. Those two commands have been inserted into the data portion of the ggplot because we're we're asking the data itself to be aesthetically displayed that way. Now. Here there's a lot of overlap, right? We have eight ratings for clarity. Some places we can see that how they're separate, but we can't really see that down below because the the yellow is painted on last and it's obscuring what's behind it. So we have some ways to deal with that. Um, line 177 shows you one way, and that's to introduce transparency settings. So here I've set the alpha to be 0.3. That's a 30% um, blocking of um, the transmission of the layers. So we can kind of see through the layers a bit to see what's behind. Um, you can experiment with changing different alphas. So an alpha of 0.7 will be somewhat solider in appearance than that but still with some transparency. And I've also asked the data to be scaled. Now what that does is set the maximum to one for each of the clarity ratings. Um, most of those maximums occur at the low carat rating, but for a couple of the clarity ratings, they occur at, at around one carat. So if you have very disparate numbers among these groups, as we do in this case with the diamonds data, scaling can, it, you know, it ch you have to understand what's happening. It's changing the data from an absolute count to a relative count, um, but it, it, it's, it would enable us to pick up some different types of patterns. All right, now these are still overlapping. We could say this is still a bit of a confusing graph so we'd want to fix it even further and here's where gg ridges comes in so this is an an add-on extension we loaded it at the beginning with library gg ridges and gg ridges will take our separate densities and automatically sort of fan them out um, in an aesthetically pleasing way um, might remind you of a joy division album cover if you think about it. Um, and you'll notice also it allows some overlap, right? It allows these peaks to sort of go up into the next line as long as they don't interfere with the data display itself, as long as they don't intersect or block something. Um, so that's a useful feature. Uh, and if we take something like, you know, we can just compare across our different um, Uh, variables, right, to, to see. So this is a price um, 
density. And we can see actually that those um, low clarity rating diamonds have these bulges at high price ranges. Because again, it turns out those diamonds are actually quite big. Another issue here, right, this is data that we have 50,000 points. We have um, a problem in when we when we looked at our original scatter plot, just going back to the beginning of uh, price versus carrot. <coughs> Excuse me. We've got all this sort of over plotting, right? We don't really know what's happening in this big black area uh, around one carrot. But with a tool like Hexbin, what Hexbin does is allow us allows us to see in these little hexagonal tiles how many uh, elements are in each segment. And it turns out that, you know, all over here, all these dark blue are 1,000 or less. But when we get down to these little diamonds, those two light blue down at the bottom left, those are 5,000 diamonds in each cell. Now, there are about 50,000 in the whole data set. So 20% of the data is all down here. All this, you know, tiny, they're not, they're not tiny, tiny, but the smallish diamonds, right, that make up the bulk of the data set. This is another thing you you know when you're exploring your data you want to understand all those patterns, um, and that might warrant you know separate analysis of this smaller group versus you know the all this area on the graph that's relatively unpopulated you know not so many diamonds up there. Hexbin will show you the hexbin technique will show you that and the ggplot command for it is gg geom hex excuse me. All right, now we're in at the um, master example for this video. And if you understand this example, I would suggest that you know you have a very good understanding of ggplot, how the syntax works. Um, and by looking at, at what we're doing in, these, in this example, uh, we see the grammar, uh, the grammatical aspect in action. Okay, so I'm going to jump in. On line 188, uh, in order to do this, I'm introducing a new um, a, a new issue. Well, you know what? This is going to have to be postponed for the second video because now my smoothing on this computer, I need the smoothing on this computer in order for this example to run. And so I am going to stop this segment of the video. I'm going to fix whatever's going wrong with my smoothing. Uh, and come back with the, the the advanced example at the beginning of the second part. Uh, so thanks for listening to this. Um, the second part will contain the fancy ggplot example and several other uh, ggplot extensions that have very interesting features for theming, for interactivity. So stay tuned for a second part. See you in a bit.